a uh, yard cleanup on the 21st, I believe. It's a Saturday coming up. And out in the foyer on the table, there's a little quarter page deals. In lieu of first Friday Family Fun Festival night, we have a fall harvest party. And so there's a little announcement there. You can certainly take some, share it with neighbors or uh, those you'd like to invite. November 3rd, it's a Friday night. 6.30 to 8.30 harvest party. And you'll hear that announced more as we go along, but um, already there's some brochures out there already. So, no go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for coming to hear the word of God. Um, we'll be continuing our study in the book of Psalms, Psalm 84. I'll be reading from that in a minute. Um, I want to share a story. This is kind of a apocryphal story, but there was this uh, Sunday school of young children, and the teacher said, asked the question, how many of you want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand but one little girl. And the teacher was kind of surprised, and she says, why didn't you raise your hand? Well, I thought you meant right now. Well, you know, this the psalmist, as we'll see, really wanted to be there right now. So I'm going to, I need to give a little background because um, there's some things that we kind of forget or maybe weren't aware of uh, that help, help us understand this psalm. Um, the sons of Korah were the godly descendants of a rebel, a rebel who joined with 249 other rebels to protest God's order in the priesthood. Didn't like it. Didn't think it was fair. And, uh, you know, God swallowed them up. But it has, there's an interesting verse. It says, but the sons of Korah did not die. So they were sons of a, of a rebel, but they were, I think they were chastised and they honored God with the, you know, the, the group of sons of Korah. They wrote several psalms. They were also temple gatekeepers. You know, they closed and opened the gates. They also took care of vessels and they also sang. So that's why we have a psalmist, the son of Korah, and he talks about being a gatekeeper in this psalm. Now, some critical things to understand. Old Testament believers had a dual vision of where God dwells. We tend to think they were really taken up with the uh, dwelling of God in the temple. That's partly true. But here is the wisest Israelite who built the temple uh, praying to God in that dedication. Now, the, the glory of God had come and already inhabited the Holy of Holies earlier on in the chapter. But here's what Solomon prays. But will God indeed, this is uh, 1 Kings 8, 27, and, verse, and also verse 30. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. And then he goes on to say, listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. And listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. So Solomon very clearly understood that. The, the true Israelite that's living by faith, the spiritual Israelite, not only saw God's presence at the temple, but looked beyond that to God's presence in heaven. So they saw both. And we're going to see this dual vision throughout this psalm. And then the old, this is the one that's kind of surprising, I think, in a way. Old Testament believers had a dual vision of Zion, the city of God. They looked beyond the earthly city to the heavenly city. Now they're hoping that they're wanting the heavenly city to take come to earth. But how do we know that? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, 13 through 16, this is the hall of faith. Here's what 
here's what the writer says. All these, this is the family of Abraham, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So even Abraham was waiting for a, 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 a heavenly city. Now you say, well, you know, they, his descendants went in and took his, you know, the, the promised land. Well, didn't that satisfy it? No, because after he goes through and talks about several of the prophets and, and various aspects uh, of the kingdom, he has this at the very end of the chapter. All these, including the prophets, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In other words, they would not come into their inherited promise but what does he say later on in the book of hebrews hebrews 12 22 we have come to that city spiritually and are headed there by faith and that that is one of the messages of the book of hebrews that we have this heavenly jerusalem and that's where we're headed he says in verse 12 24 of hebrews but you have come to mount zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels in festal array, or the general assembly, and the church of the firstborn, that's us, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, that's the Old Testament saints, who now come into their inheritance, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. In other words, his blood speaks that we are saved. We just celebrated that. So we we have to keep this in mind, the dual vision that this psalmist and true spiritual uh, Israelites had, the dual vision of where God dwells and the dual vision of the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. They see through both of the earthly ones to the heaven. So um, let's read the passage. Let's pray and read the passage. And then we'll uh, look at what it, the Lord has for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that you've given us. Thank you for the promise of heaven. Thank you that, it is you, that Jesus Christ secured that promise for us. And Father, we trust you to teach us by your spirit this morning and help us to truly um, look forward to the riches that we have, the promises that we have, uh, even in heaven. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 84, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh. Sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. and They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. So I've entitled this Travel Guide to Heaven for Happy, happy Travelers. Because it's definitely, he's talking about wanting to be in Jerusalem, the, the earthly Zion, and traveling there. 
And he also, there are verses here that only make sense if he's also looking at the eternal um, heavenly Jerusalem. So there's three, there's three um, beatitudes in this. You know, the beatitudes are blessed are, happy are. And it's, it's a happiness that God bestows. Not only do we, uh, not only do we feel happy, we are happy. We have a happy, a happy and good situation. So that there are in verse four, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. Verse five, how blessed is the, the man whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways of Zion. And then verse 12, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. So we'll be looking at those. We're going to look at them with a kind of a travel emphasis. So uh, many of you know, Susan and I spent uh, a long time camping this summer. And our latest one in August and uh, early in September, we went to Glacier National Park, um, Yellowstone, and the Tetons. And we were gone almost three weeks. Now, Glacier is a long way from here. It was a long trip. We enjoyed our trip. We, it was, God's creation is awesome and amazing. I'll talk a little bit about that. But at the end of those three weeks, both of us, the day before we were supposed to come home, we had scheduled, well, our little homing beacon went off. And we said, we want to be home. Up until then, we were really enjoying what we were doing, but we wanted to be home. I'd had us, I, you know, every time I travel and gone where I, my homing beacon goes off. Heather and I, um, many years ago, uh, when she was a freshman in college, during spring break, went to uh, Southern England and Paris. And we had had a long day and we'd seen some great castles and we'd been to Shakespeare's birthplace and we were in Stratford and Avon. It was raining, we were hungry, we were tired and my homing beacon went off. We still had five days to go. So, but, you know, it kind of, it's kind of an illustration. We're longing for home, but there's still some traveling to do. And, you know, I just felt like every step I was taking from then on, the next five days, I was getting closer to home. And that's what this, this in a way, is what this psalm is about. So let's look at dwelling in heaven is true happiness. And that's verse four. But he, he gives some reasons why it is, you know. It isn't, you know, the sweet by and by, you know, someday. It really has some stuff, substance. And he says... How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. And that is trying to cram eternity into a few words. We don't realize it, but it's, we will live in an environment that is physically beautiful and desirable beyond imagination. You know, what's heaven like? Well, it's kind of hard to describe because it's way beyond imagination. I'm going to talk about that. But as a Levite, he lived in a, in a Levite city and would travel to Jerusalem once a year and serve about a month. And the courts of the Lord at the time of Solomon, everything, all the walls were gold inlaid with tapestries uh, woven in of purple and red and blue. I mean, it was unbelievably beautiful in regards to human crafting. And he, he wants to be there, but he sees way beyond that because he ultimately, in verse 4, he says, dwell. He doesn't get to dwell there. He doesn't, but he wants to. And the only way he's going to get to dwell in God's presence is when God brings his heavenly Zion to earth. And that's what he's looking forward to. Well, what about us? We're looking forward to that. What are we looking forward to? So I just read... Uh, for a book club, The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis. And it closes with a couple chapters on Lewis trying to describe heaven. And it's kind of fun to see how he deals with time and dimension and everything else like that. But one description he has, he, he's trying to describe heaven. He says, you know, he talks about the, some of the fruits of heaven, you know, the fruits that you eat. And he says, think of 
the most juicy, sweetest, succulent pear that you've ever eaten. It's woody and dry and dusty compared to what you will have in heaven. And Paul, when he's taken to heaven, he comes back and he says, I heard things I, it's impossible to, dis, to utter. John, when he describes heaven, there's a sea of glass and there's transparent golden streets. Have you ever seen any of those? A sea of glass. It doesn't just mean there's a lot of glass. It means a sea of glass. He can't describe it because it's beyond description. When we get there, we are going to be overwhelmed. Susan and I, when we were at Glacier, went on the going to the Sun Road. And we were about halfway up. And you were see down in this valley, massive valley, that the glaciers have carved out. And you see these giant mountains. And it takes your breath away. You're, you're emotional. You're just... The awesome beauty there, I mean, I almost cried. I mean, it was just so awesome. Heaven is going to be infinitely beyond that in what we see in every aspect. And it won't just be physical, it'll be spiritual too. So that's why he wants to be there. But he goes on, it's not just the beauty of the place, it's who's there. We will not just have glimpses of the Lord through a glass darkly, but enjoy him richly. He says, my soul long and even yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy. Actually, it's cry out for the living God. Why? Because God is beyond our greatest. You think of the best thing in this world. God is way beyond that. We see it pretty fuzzily. I mean, we, we celebrate it in breaking bread. We have those op, op, times in our lives when we really realize the goodness of the Lord. Uh, we have answer to prayer, we have fellowship, all of these things. Those are really fuzzy compared to what we're going to experience when we're with the Lord in heaven. It will be without all the distractions and all the self-centeredness. And I mean, there's a thing called flow in, in sports and in other things where you totally forget about yourself and you're involved in the moment. We will just be totally involved in the Lord. That's what he's longing for. And not only at the temple where they have the great worship services, they didn't have worship services any place but the temples in his day. And he wants to be there. But the worship service in heaven will be amazing because we'll have the Lord there. And thirdly, we'll be truly at home. You know, if you've ever been away for a while, you like to get home, be with the people you have, get with your routine and all the things you can depend on. When you travel, there's all kinds of surprises. But the bird, literally the sparrow, also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Now he's not celebrating the birds in the temple. The, you know, the part of the temple was open to the outside and birds would nest in the, in the eaves. And He's, he's using that as a metaphor, how the worthless sparrow and the, the uh, swallow who never sits still, the restless swallow, both find a home. That's our soul. Our souls are restless and in ourselves. We need Christ to save us. We find a home. And we will be truly at home there. And then finally, uh, as we've already talked about a little bit, verse 4, we will be enthralled with the goodness of the Lord that his praises will flow from us joyfully. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. We will have that spiritual flow where we just are so thrilled with the Lord because we get to see him as he really is. Now, the next section is traveling to heaven and the Lord's strength is true happiness and with his travel guide in, this, in our hearts. And so that I'm going to go on to the, we've talked about how wonderful this destination is. You know, Susan and I are going to Italy and, and Israel and we really love Italy and we, we want to be there. It's, there's some great things. So we're preparing to go there. But 
And so we talked about our greatest destination and some of the reasons why, and we'll hear more reasons why it's a great place to go. Um, but we need, we've got to get there. And so he says, how blessed is the man whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. So, you know, taking it from just the earthly standpoint, this Levite had quite a, he had to walk all the way to Jerusalem from wherever he was. And most of us, you know, don't well, walk under 5,000 steps a day. He had to go <laughs> many, many, many miles. He needed strength to do that. He probably needed a place to stay overnight. But he knew the way. And we know the way. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if we have the, the paths in our heart and the Lord gives us the strength, we can head for heaven. And that's what he's talking about. So we're going to talk, at, talk about it from a travel standpoint. So there's the touring. There's being a tourist. Verse 6. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. So what I've said is, as we travel, the Lord brings blessing through us to the world around us. Okay, so it is, it is metaphorical, but it is hard to apply it to just the earthly Zion traveling to the earthly Zion. So did they stop and dig wells? Or did, as they walked along, all of a sudden, boop, water popped up? He's using, he's using this metaphorically for life, not for the travel to Zion. Though you could say, I'm so excited about traveling from my Levite city to Zion that the world looked just wonderful around me. No, that isn't, that is very un-Jewish. Jewish, Jewish people deal with reality pretty harshly. I mean, they're pretty earthly sometimes. So this has to be about our travel to the heavenly Jerusalem because it's life. It's our travel through life. So passing through the Valley of Baca, Baca is, um, it isn't weeping. It, you know, some translations have that. It is basically um, a tree that grows only in the, in very, like our sage, it only grows in very dry areas, dry, dusty areas. They make it a spring, or literally, literally springs. They make it an oasis. Christians and Christianity have been a phenomenal blessing. God blesses the world through us. Hospitals, universities, many other things have, have only existed because Christians started them. And we are a blessing to our neighbors, our friends, the people at work. God blesses them through us, even though they may not acknowledge it. Many of the jobs I've had in, I, the Lord has used me to make it a better place and more productive, so on and so forth. But, and then not only does God work through us, when he showers blessings on us in our lives, it flows to other people. That's the early rain also covers it with blessing. That is God pouring blessing on us and those around us benefit directly from God, even though they may not acknowledge it. So, you know, tourists are a mixed blessing. So uh, when we went to a Glacier, you have to get reservations to get into any of the places during the, the, the high season. You can't just go in, you have to get a reservation because they're limiting the numbers because before there were so many people there, you couldn't move. So, you know, too many tourists trample the place kind of, but you know, Maui wants tourists to come. They depend on it. You know, they've been burnt down, but they still depend on tourism. That's their lifeblood, so to speak. So there, the, you know, there is tourism that is productive. We're, as we've said, we're not tourists who trash the countryside. We're tourists that make it better because of the grace of God. Transportation. Our destination is the Lord, and it's guaranteed by Him. So you know, I we're seriously considering buying travel insurance. Well, the Lord is our travel insurance to heaven. 
These are transportation. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. You know, we're not going to need jets to get to heaven. The Lord's bringing us there. And then travel assistance. So uh, one of the things that you always want to have is various forms of travel assistance. You know, if you have a guidebook, they'll tell you, you know, there's the tourist office, there's the embassy, there's the various other things for travel assistance. Well, our travel assistance is prayer. The means of strength of journey is prayer. We ask the Lord to fulfill his promise of bringing in the eternal city through his Messiah. Now, verse 9 is nobody knows how to really translate that, you know, and explain it. So I'm going to give my best explanation of it. I think he's he's praying for the coming of the Messiah. So verse 8, it says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, uh, O God of Jacob. So he's he, there's an implied prayer. Hear me when I pray, because he just expressed in groanings his desire to be and dwell with the Lord, not only in Jerusalem, but forever. And that's an implied prayer. And that's, we pray for that. We want to be with the Lord and we want strength for the day and to continue to move on uh, on our pilgrimage. But then he says, behold our shield, O God. And it, the, the Hebrew scholar that I consulted said, O God, our shield, behold. And the reason they translate it the other way is because most people say he's praying for the current king of Israel, the anointed one. But it, if he is, he's also praying beyond that for the ultimate anointed one, the Messiah. So I, I take it, I'm going to take it that way because when he says, and look upon the face of your anointed, it has to be a king. In this case, the anointed is the king, but it may be the king of Israel, but it's ultimately the uh, Messiah because he wants the messianic kingdom to come in. That's where the blessing comes because he sees beyond just the king to the king. So here's what God's promise to David was. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne will be established forever. Susan and I, if we make it to Israel in the spring, we will not be going to see a king on a throne. So how was this fulfilled? David's immediate descendant, descendants did not fulfill it. The forever kingdom. Only Jesus Christ did. And so he's saying, when look upon the face of your anointed, he's saying, have him on earth so he can bring that messianic blessing. Because the next one says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. What's the word for, therefore? It's because the Messiah comes and sets up that the new kingdom on earth, the heavenly kingdom. Trusting the Lord for his promises brings true happiness. God's promise of a kingdom on earth will be fulfilled and will be part of that kingdom the, the the Jews of the Old Testament who trusted in Christ will be part of that kingdom. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And this is going to be truly fulfilled in God's messianic kingdom. And we will be part of that. We will get a, a preview when we are raptured, but we pray, just like him, even so come, Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. Those are Christian prayers. We're looking forward to his coming and setting up that place where a day here, a day there doesn't compare. I mean, we cannot compare anything to what goes on. The best day here doesn't compare to the infinite, infinite goodness there. And then the Lord abundantly provides for our journey. So he says, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He gives us insight into life. Now, so you can't, in the psalmist day, you could not travel by night. And we just learned we live in a very dark world. 
So spiritually speaking, God needs to be our son. He needs to give us insight. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And he protects us. This is an evil world. We need protection. Now, he needed both of those to a certain degree to, to make it from his Levite city to Jerusalem. But even more importantly, this world is a dangerous place to live. And he needed God's insight and protection. Now, he, the Lord gives grace and glory. He provides favor. We've talked about that. And he honors us. He's going to say someday to those who, as we'll find out, who are, have integrity, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he's also going to give us responsibilities. But we'll enjoy those. He will give us honor and glory. And he says, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That word uprightly is with integrity. You know, God says he will give give the uh, a crown to those who love his appearing, love Christ's appearing. When we love Christ's appearing, and that's what we're, we realize we're headed to, you know, you're, you're in Stratford-on-Avon and you're headed home. You know, every step takes you hope closer to home. You work with integrity. You don't get sidetracked with these cute little things in the world. You walk with integrity. And that's what God gives us everything we need for that walk. So he concludes, how blessed is the man who trusts you. And it's the Lord of hosts. And we're going to be in heaven. It's a wonderful place with people we love and I want to talk a little bit more about that. We need some travel resources to get there. And specifically, we need a visa. So you cannot go to another country unless they let you in. It's, unless it's the United States. But, sorry, one thing. Um, but a visa is that country's permission to let you in. You know, people from... The, the Europe basically has an open visa for us, but it's still permission to come in. But you cannot get into that country without a visa. You cannot get into heaven without God's permission. And that only comes through Christ. Here's what Jesus says about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way. His death on the cross, his paying for our sins, his resurrection and its ability to save us when we ask, that's what gets us into hell. That's what guarantees it. We need a tour guide. You know, Susan and I generally are what they call independent travelers, and we re read all kinds of stuff and go to places that are interesting. But every once in a while, we've hired a tour guide, and they are a wealth of information that we would have never gotten on our own. They take us places we would have never not known to go. The Holy Spirit gives us insight in this dark world on the path we need to take. And, of course, he uses the word of God because that's where the travel tips are. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, Rick Steves' Back Door to Europe books, all that, he, he takes you places where you'd never realize because he has all these travel tips. Well, we have that in the word of God and way beyond that. Now, when we go to uh, Italy, Lord willing, and Israel, we'll have to get change our American dollars into euros and shekels. They don't take dollars there in the stores. God doesn't take dollars in heaven. You have to send it ahead. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither raw not fit, moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. We need to send our treasure to heaven. And, and how do you do that? We'll talk uh, one of the main ways in a second. But there are dozens of scripture about rewards in the New Testament. There's the crowns. There's all these things. You will not be unrewarded. I will pay you back. All of these things. Read about those in the New Testament. That's how you send money ahead. And then he, the lodging. 
and, he's, and he, this is a parable. He concludes a parable, Jesus does. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by the means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. We can take our money and give it to the Lord, give it to missionaries. Um, we can take our time and help others. We talked a little bit about that. But one of my favorite songs, I don't hear it very often because it's you know, in the past, the, the dark ages, I guess, it's by Ray Bolts called Thank You for Giving to the Lord. And it, and it touches me every time I hear it because it's about a man. People, He's in heaven and people come up to him and thank him for giving to the missionary. You know, they're a foreign, you know, person the missionary had preached the gospel to and they'd gotten saved his Sunday school students who he had taught and they had trusted the Lord and gone on to serve the Lord. Many other. There will be people welcoming us into heaven, those we've ministered to directly or indirectly. They'll welcome us into heaven. But most importantly, as it says, we will stand before the Lord. He will welcome us into heaven. So we're looking forward to a place that's a thousand times better than here. Let's take that travel to heaven, realize where we're headed, keep the focus on being with the Lord, and take care of the people around us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Christ's name. Thank you for your word. We trust you to make us uh, heavenly minded in a way that spreads grace around us to the people who need it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.